we had a peach tree in our backyard at the home I grew up in in Tennessee. My brother and I used to love to go out in, when the tree was ripe and to sit under the tree and eat peaches as much as we could handle. We would eat them down as far as we could down to the pit, and we would nibble on the pit and get all the fruit off of it. And sometimes we'd even put it in our mouth and suck everything off to get them as clean as possible. And we'd make little piles of peach pits there under the tree because inevitably we would play war and throw them at each other. We even threw them at the dog, but I'm, I'm less proud of that. We would take those peach pits and we would get them down to the smallest part. In fact, we would suck on it to get everything out that we could possibly get. What we didn't know then is that there is actually something inside of a peach pit that can be lethal. There's an element, it's tiny, virtually invisible to the human eye, inside of a peach pit that when ingested, and it comes in contact particularly with stomach acids, it forms a new compound. And it becomes a new element, one we commonly refer to as cyanide. There's enough of this element inside of a peach pit to be lethal if swallowed. The deceitful thing about that is it doesn't look dangerous, does it? A peach pit looks like a, a knotty little just barky piece of wood. And yet inside is something extremely dangerous. If you saw, for instance, a bottle that had a red label on it and a skull and crossbones on it, it had hazard symbols on it and a giant warning across the top that said, warning, cyanide, what would you do? You would avoid it, right? You wouldn't pick it up and lick it just to see. No, all the signs are there, right? All the warning symbols are there. It looks dangerous. It is dangerous. It is obviously something that can be harmful to you. There are certain sins in this world and temptations in this world that are obviously very dangerous. There are certain sins that if I just name them, they they make you feel sort of dark. They feel evil. When you speak of genocide, when you speak of rape, when you speak of murder, when you speak of child abuse, these these sins, they have like a giant skull and crossbones on them. They, They sound dangerous. And we know, every one of us, know to avoid those big, scary, dangerous things. In fact, I doubt that few of us There are many of us that will be tempted by some of these big things. We know to avoid them. But there are other things, other sins, other temptations that may not seem dangerous at first glance. In fact, they may look like a a juicy, delicious peach, but buried inside of them is something that can be dangerous. These sins are very subtle. These sins are sometimes hidden. In fact, Jerry Bridges, one of the books that I recommended in the pastor's picks today, he calls these sins respectable sins. There are things in our society that are respectable things, that at the core of them they may actually be sinful. For instance, no one ever speaks evil of ambition. Ambition's good, right? People should work hard. It's good for people to to earn a living. It's good to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's good to make a living for yourself and to provide for your family. We give awards for ambition. We honor people who are ambitious. But sometimes, if you look closely enough, what lies at the heart of ambition is actually greed. But it's a respectable sin because no one wants to speak evil of ambition. And these things are very deceitful. We have to be on our guard. 
Sometimes when we make that phone call to tell someone, hey, did, I, I want to share a prayer request with you. I, I want to, to, to let you add this to your prayer list. And we sort of mask it in this idea of sharing a prayer request. But it's at the heart of what we're doing is actually a desire for gossip. And it's respectable. I want you to pray for this. But we're really, there's something subtle inside of what we're saying and what we are doing. You see, we all know the big skull and crossbone, the cyanide sins in this world. And I, I venture to say most of us know to avoid these things. But in our text this morning, we are reminded through the temptation of Jesus, often the things that we are most tempted with are the most subtle. The things we don't see. The things that, that don't have a big warning label on them. But they're still dangerous nonetheless. We see in the temptation of Jesus some of the most subtle and deceitful and unassuming sins that come our way every single day. You see, when it comes to cyanide, it doesn't matter if it comes in a pill form or it comes in a peach pit. It can be lethal either way. And sin, though it may come in a skull and crossbones, something big and obvious that everybody knows is wrong, or if it comes in something subtle, something respectable, it's still dangerous. It's still sinful. And it's still something we must seek to avoid. Look with me in Matthew chapter 4 this morning at these subtle sins. And consider what God's Word says. Let's begin reading actually in verse 16 of chapter 3. Let's back up a little bit and begin from there. The Scriptures say, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand it is written, You shall not put your, the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and began to minister to him. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes when I read a text and a passage of Scripture like this, I find myself wondering, what does this have to do with me? There are sometimes passages of Scripture that we know all of God's Word is profitable, but it's hard to see sometimes what this has to do with us. I mean, let's be honest, the temptations that Jesus faces here are probably not temptations that we daily encounter. How many of you in your daily life are tempted to turn stones into bread? Raise your hands. Nobody. How many of us are, are daily tempted to jump off the church roof expecting angels to catch us? Nobody. How many of us are, are tempted daily to, to, to worship the devil? and to, to have the glory of all the kingdoms brought before us. At first glance, it doesn't look like this passage has anything to do with us. This is so transcendent. This is so other. It seems like this is just relegated to Jesus. This has nothing to do with you and me. And it can be very easy to dismiss this passage as saying, it's irrelevant. I mean, these are things that I don't encounter. This has nothing to do with me. But if you look closely, 
if you examine it closely, what you will see is that hidden inside of, of these things is something very, very dangerous that all of us encounter. There are temptations behind the temptations. And these are the things that we face on a very daily basis. We must be aware of these. And we must be on our guard against them so that God can be honored in our life. Notice the first temptation in this text that Jesus faced and all of us face. And that is, number one, he was tempted to doubt God's word in difficult times. Temptation number one is to doubt God's word in difficult times. It says in this text, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and there he was tempted. He was fasted, verse 2, for 40 days and 40 nights. There is an illusion here that Matthew is giving us, a a, a sort of a a, a curtain call, a, a flashback to Israel. You remember they spent how many years in the wilderness? 40 years. And now here is Jesus spending 40 days in the wilderness. But the difference between the two is that while Israel was in the wilderness 40 years, they repeatedly failed. But Jesus, while he is in the wilderness for 40 days, repeatedly succeeds. And Matthew is showing us, and particularly his Jewish readers, look, when when you're looking, don't look to Israel for your hope. Look to Jesus. He is the greater Israel. He is the fulfillment of everything that Israel was supposed to be. Our hope must not rest in our nationality and in our heritage, but in Christ. He says, look to Jesus. He did not fail his wilderness test. I think there's also an anti-picture here with Adam. Remember what Paul says that Jesus is the second Adam? If you compare the two, look at the contrast. Adam and he, Adam was where? In a perfect garden. Jesus is in a desolate wilderness. Adam had Eve for accountability, and yet Jesus is all by himself. Adam has one temptation, one thing to deal with, and here Jesus has three. Adam had all of the odds environmentally stacked in his favor, but he failed. And Jesus, who has all of the odds stacked against him environmentally, succeeds. That's why our hope is in the second Adam, not in the first. In the first Adam we have corruption, but in the second Adam we have redemption because he has succeeded where we fail. He says here he fasted for 40 years days in the wilderness. Now, we can read this quickly sometimes and miss how difficult and taxing this would have been. Having not eaten for this time, Jesus would be physically exhausted, physically drained, physically challenged. He was being spiritually challenged by Satan. There's a psychological challenge if you are the Son of God. There's an emotional challenge going on. Does God really love me? Is He going to provide for me? And He is being challenged on all these fronts. One of the most noted ones, he says at the end of verse 2, he then became hungry. Now, I've said before that Jesus at this point was my age. Sometimes we think of Jesus being like a 60-year-old guy. He was 30. Now, he was in much better shape than I am, trust me. Growing up in an agrarian society and being the son of a carpenter, he would have been very physically fit. But even for the most of fit athletes, going 40 days without eating will take a toll on your body. He, he would likely have lost maybe 20, 30 pounds during this time. He would be experiencing gnawing stomach pains, splitting migraine headaches. As he stumbled through this craggy, rocky terrain, he may have even been fainting and blacking out from weakness and exhaustion. His body is being taxed. He is physically being worn down. And Jesus is clearly at what we can say is a low point. Have you ever been at a low point, by the way? Where it seems like physically, emotionally, spiritually, everything is challenging you. And you can't seem to get ahead. And you feel lonely like you're in the wilderness. The good news is Jesus knows what that feels like. He is our great great priest who has been tempted in every way. But here's what I want you to notice. He is at this low point. And it came just after a noticeable high point. 
at his baptism, just a few days earlier, when he is brought to John and he is baptized, the king is anointed, the heavens rip open, the Spirit of God descends as a dove, and there the Father, in a voice, declares for all to hear, You are the Son of God. And in that instant, just a few days later, the devil comes and whispers into his ear and asks, Are you sure? You see, he's placing doubt about the believability and the reliability of God's Word. Verse 3, if you are the Son of God. Verse 6, if you are the Son of God. And later in verses 8 and 9, he doesn't say it expressly, but he's implying, if you are the Son of God, these kingdoms are already yours. Just take them. He's putting doubt in the mind of Jesus. What you have here is Satan saying to the Son of God, prove it. Prove it. Because by the looks of things, Jesus, given your low point, given how hungry you are, given how challenged you are, it looks at this point that you don't look much like the Son of God to me. The Son of God wouldn't be hungry and in so much pain. My friends, listen to me. The root, the starting point of all temptation, the starting point is doubting God's Word. That's where it begins. That's where the battle must be fought. The starting point before the sin ever comes is the temptation to say, well, I've got this choice, and I can either believe God's Word and do this or not do this, or I can say, you know what, I know better than God, I'm going to doubt God's Word, I'm going to do what I want to do. That's where it begins. Doubting God's Word. As soon as the devil plants even a seed of doubt in the soil of your mind, it is only a matter of time before the fruit of sin comes forth. You remember back in Genesis chapter 3, I said last week, the devil, the serpent, did not tempt Eve by saying, eat the fruit, eat the fruit, eat the fruit, eat the fruit. How did he tempt her? He asked a question. Indeed, has God really said that? Did God really say, Eve, because if he's a loving, good, gracious God, he wouldn't keep something like this from you. Come on, think about it, Eve. If He really is gracious and loving and good, why would He prohibit you? He's just trying to be a cosmic killjoy and stop you from having fun. And He placed doubt. Did God really say that? And He says the same to Jesus here. Did God really say from heaven a few days ago, you are the Son of God? Because you sure don't look like it. You see, what happened in the garden The serpent said to Eve, the tempter said to her, Are you sure this is what your father said? And then in the wilderness, we find here that the tempter says to Jesus, Are you sure this is what your father said? And every day in our homes, in our workplaces, in our minds, in our hearts, the tempter is saying to every one of us, Are you sure that's what your father said? And he wants to put doubt in your mind that God can't be trusted. You know better than God does. You should just listen to what you want to do. Are you sure that's what your father said? Philippians 4, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And the tempter says to you, Then why are you unemployed if God cares about you? Romans 8, 1. But there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. And the tempter says to you, then why do you feel so guilty about your past? Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And the tempter says to you, why is it then that you are so unhappy? Why is it that you're so discontent? Maybe God is not that all-satisfying shepherd that He claims to be. And he places a seed of doubt in your heart. That's where the temptation starts. And that's where we have to fight the battle. You see, what we end up doing in situations too often, and this is where our theology gets out of whack, is when we start interpreting God's Word by our circumstances. When what we need to do instead is to interpret our circumstances in light of God's Word. This is the unchanging thing. This is the transcendent thing. This does not change with time or days or seasons. 
Your life will ebb and flow forwards and backwards, but the Word of God does not change, and this is the rock upon which we are to build our lives. Knowing that God's Word can always be trusted. Jesus says to him in verse 5, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, Jesus says, Listen, the Word of God is enough to sustain me. The Word of God is enough to guide me. The Word of God is reliable in every single way. I'm just like you. I find myself sometimes having doubts that creep into the back of my mind about when life just gets hectic and things just don't go the way that I planned them. And I think, God, what are you, what are you doing? And I find doubts creeping into my heart and doubts wanting to creep into my mind. But if you hang around me long enough, you'll hear me in my prayers repeatedly say something. And it's not because I run out of things to pray. But I will often, especially in those circumstances, in difficult times, I will confess, God, I know that you are always good, you are always wise, and you are always sovereign in all things and in all ways. And God, I don't understand what I'm going through in life, but I know that you're good, you're wise, you're sovereign. And your word can be trusted. And I have to build my life around these things. My friends, the way that we combat the temptation to doubt God's word is that we feed ourselves God's word. It is the immovable anchor that keeps us in place It is the shelter that we need. Proverbs chapter 30, this is a great verse. It says, every word of God is tested. In other words, every word of God is reliable. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. So my friends, where are you doubting God? That's the place that the fight begins. That's where we have to look out for, doubting God's word. The second temptation is the temptation not only to doubt God, but secondly, to manipulate God, to manipulate God's hand for your own benefit, to manipulate God's hand for your own benefit. Now, at first glance, this second temptation here doesn't look much like a temptation. In fact, it looks kind of odd. We can understand the first temptation. Jesus is hungry, and the tempter says to, to turn the stones into bread to you know, sort of fulfill his natural appetites. We can understand that, being hungry wanting to, to make something to eat. And we can sort of understand the third one, wanting all the glory of all the kingdoms. I mean, who wouldn't want everybody to be their friend on Facebook? I mean, it's sort of a, an, an ego trip, right? Everybody will love you. Everybody will worship you. You know, you'll be of the headlines. We can understand that temptation because that sort of appeals to us. But this second temptation doesn't sound like a temptation to me. Notice what he says in verse 5. He takes him up to the pinnacle, the high point of the temple, verse 6, and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. I mean, that's like somebody saying, yeah, I'm really tempted to drive my car into oncoming traffic. That doesn't sound like a temptation. It sounds crazy to me. And yet he says to him, throw yourself down. But notice why. That's the key. Verse 6. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, and they, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The devil says, okay, you want to talk Bible? I'll talk some Bible with you. Here's what the Psalms have to say about this. Go up there and, and throw yourself down, because God's Word says that He will protect you. God's Word says that He will take care of you. The devil, by the way, is a preacher. In fact, he's an expositor. He uses God's Word for his own interest. In fact, I think that's another temptation sort of inherent within this second one here, is the temptation to misapply God's Word, to misinterpret Scripture, to take one verse and rip it out of context for our own benefits. Ask and it shall be given, seek and it shall find, knock and it shall be opened, and we think, well, that means God owes me a blank check. No, that's misapplying the Bible. And we have a great, massive amount of this happening in the church today where the Bible is being abused and perverted for personal 
interests. And we must be on our guard. We must interpret Scripture with Scripture and understand it, right? And Jesus, in hearing this temptation, says to him, verse 7, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, Jesus says, the Bible says, Don't be presumptuous. Don't presume upon God. God is not your bail bondsman just to get you out of trouble. So often, I find people, even Christian people, that do things and they will categorize it and say, well, it was a, that this was a choice, this is an act of faith, when really it was an act of stupidity. You know, well, you know, God wanted me to do this and I sort of stepped out and did this and they make a foolish decision and then want God to bail them out of it. That's precisely the temptation here. To try and manipulate God's hand for their own benefit. People say, well, since my daughter and her boyfriend got pregnant, it must have been the will of God. That's fatalism. That's not biblical. Yes, the grace of God can and does work despite our sin, but knowing that the grace of God is there does not give us the license to go out and sin. Romans 6.1, should we continue in sin so that grace can abound? And the answer is, heavens, no. Don't put God to this test. Don't presume on the, the, the grace of God. Well, I can just go out and sin and do whatever I want. The grace of God will always be there. He says that's the wrong attitude to have. Don't put God to the test. Because you may find yourself like Israel who wakes up and has found themselves in captivity because they presumed on the grace of God. Jesus said, do not put God to the test. One of our deacons said it this way a few months ago. I thought it was excellent. He said, too often we do dumb stuff and then we pray, okay God, bless this mess. We do dumb stuff, and then we pray, okay, God, bless this mess. Folks, that is not Christianity. That is paganism. If you look over the annals of history, you find that there is, is ample evidence. The Philistines and all these other nations that surrounded Israel, this is exactly how their religion worked. They would sort of do what they wanted to do and plant their crops, and then they would go to the temple, and, and they had these fertility gods and goddesses and all these rituals that, that were sexual and perverted because they were saying, well, maybe God will see us, and He will then be happy with what we do, and He'll give us good crops. Trying to manipulate God for their own benefit. They simply want God to, to sort of to, to get them out of the trouble that they found themselves in. These are the people that say, well, I've got myself into some financial trouble. I've got credit card debt. My finances are wrecked. But you know what I need to do? If I just go to church and give my 10%, God will bail me out. We may not say it, but often we do it. Thinking, if I do this, then God owes me one, right? If I just do this, then, then, then God's, you know, they're, 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 He's on my list. My, my marriage, my family, my, my whole life is a wreck. It's falling apart. So if I just throw myself in the altar, if I just throw myself at the pastor, maybe if I just do some penance, then God will fix everything. That's paganism. It's not Christianity. You see, those who treat God in this way do not want a king. They want a magic genie. And God is not a magic genie. And he is not to be tested. And he is not to be presumed upon when we do foolish and sinful things. So we have to examine our heart in this matter. We have to examine our motivations. Am I doing this so that God owes me one? Or looking at everything that God has done for me through the cross of Christ, do I live in obedience and worship? So often I fear that we, we do our devotions and we pray and we check it off the list, think if I live a good life, then good things will happen. That's karma. That's not Christ. And that's what the pagans do. And the devil looks at Jesus and says, go ahead, there's what the Bible says. Go ahead and presume on God. Do something stupid, foolish. Jump off the temple and God will save. We need to be careful if we're trying to manipulate God's hand. Number three, and finally. The third temptation behind the temptations is to ignore God's will 
in favor of a shortcut. To ignore God's will in favor of a shortcut. Notice in verse 8, the last and final temptation, it says, The devil took him to a very high mountain. We don't know which mountain this is. But he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. We had a great discussion last week in our Koinonia group. Was this a literal vision? Was, it, was, it, was he actually seeing things or was it just a vision? Oh, I said that right. Was, he, was, it, was it some place that he was looking at certain kingdoms? Or was this actually some sort of spiritual, you know, mystical vision that he had? I'm not going to tell you the answer. You have to discuss it in your own Koinonia groups. So he said to him, verse 9, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Now, like the last temptation, this one also is rooted in Scripture. Again, the devil's a preacher. And he knows how to use the Bible to deceive you. Psalm 2, listen to what it says. It's a messianic psalm. It's about Christ. And he says, He, that being God, said to me, that being the Messiah, You are my son, today I have begotten you. What does that sound like? The baptism of Jesus, right? That's the statement. That there's coming a day when the Messiah will be, and the Father will declare, This is my son whom I have begotten. Then notice the next verse. Ask of me, God says to the Messiah, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possessions. The devil says, hey, you remember Psalm 2? If you really are the Son of God, then the nations are already yours. The kingdoms are already yours. The Psalms presume it. They say that. So why don't you just take a little shortcut, bow down to me because I'm the, the ruler of this world at this current time, and I'll give them to you Look at he splits. And he tempts him to ignore God's plan. Because you see, the plan of God and for God's Messiah was not to come and to receive the nations through devil worship. It was to come and to receive the nations by dying on the cross for the sins of those nations. I love Philippians chapter 2, which explains what we call the incarnation. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, God becoming a man. And you get to the very end of that, verse 11. We all know verse 11, right? Psalm two, uh, Philippians 2.11. And he has given the name that is above every name, right? That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That, that's a pretty big statement, right? That, that Jesus is glorified and honored and worshipped by all the people and all the tongues of all the world. But listen, you cannot have Philippians 2.11 without going through Philippians 2.8. And Philippians 2.8 is, God became a man, not just a man, but a servant, not just a servant, but one who died, and not just one who died, but one who died on the cross for our sins. Jesus could not have the crown until He first endured the cross. You see that? That was the plan of God. You see, so often for you and for me, we find ourselves being tempted because we are so impatient. You know? It's not that we just want something that God has for us. We want it now. And that's what the devil says to Jesus. This is yours, and you can have it right now. Just ignore God's plan. And right now, if you just compromise in this one little area, you can have all of this right in this instance. It's like the story we read earlier of Samuel and Saul. You remember that? Saul is going to go out to battle and he has to have God's blessing. And he's waiting on Samuel and Samuel doesn't show up and he's watching his watch and Samuel doesn't show up and he's about to go to battle and he realizes the offering's got to be given. And against the Word of God, he tries a shortcut. I'll do it. I'll offer the sacrifice. And so he offers the sacrifice and lays it out there, and Samuel gets there, and what does he say? Because you took a shortcut and didn't listen to the will of God, you have lost the kingdom. It's amazing to think about. This one little shortcut, what does it matter? Instead of Samuel, it's me. It's still the thing that God wants, but it was not God's plan in God's way and in God's time. And it's really a great anti-picture again. Because to Jesus, he waits and he gets the kingdoms. Samuel is impatient and he says what? You've lost the kingdom. It's gone. And so often in our lives, we want what God has for us, but we want it impatiently and imprudently. And we want it now. 
and we miss out on what God has for us. The great temptation, I think, that we as Americans face is the temptation of self-gratification, an instant gratification. We want it now. We don't want any patience or have to wait. I've said before, we are microwavable people serving a crock-pot God. He doesn't work on our timetable. And we have to work on His. We see in our world today the gigantic problem with this, and there may even been some here this morning, particularly teenagers and young people, the issue when it comes to sex and intimacy. It is a wonderful, beautiful, fantastic gift of God that He wants us to enjoy. But too many are saying, well, I want the shortcut. I'll have it now. And there are great consequences in that. I'm going to take a shortcut. And yet, God says, that is a very dangerous sin. Remember Abraham? God says to him, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah. And a little time goes by and there's no son and there's no son. And Abraham gets impatient and Sarah gets impatient. So she says, here, take Hagar. We'll try this shortcut. And what happens? Ishmael is born and the world has never been the same since. All the problems in the Middle East go back to Isaac and Ishmael to this day. Why? Because Abraham tried a shortcut. We have to be very careful, very careful, that we're fulfilling God's plan in God's way. Isaiah 40, what does it say? They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint because they've waited on God. Have you ever dropped something in your kitchen sink? and decided to retrieve it. You know, you drop your ring or something else down the kitchen sink. And it's not the most pleasant thing in the world to do, but you sort of stick your fingers down in there, you know. You may have to take the pipes off, you know, underneath to get it out. And you'll go down the it because it's, it's the kitchen sink, you know. But if you drop that same thing down the toilet, you think twice. Do I really need my wedding ring, you know. Because the toilet is obviously gross. The kitchen sink, not so bad, but the toilet, we we all know better. But listen to me. The toilet and the kitchen sink both lead to the same sewer. We all know the big cyanide sins, the skull and crossbone sins, the murder and rape and child abuse to stay away from. But are we being careful about the cyanide in the peach pit? Are we being careful about the respectable sins? Are we being careful about doubting God and trying to manipulate God and ignoring what God wants as best? My friends, it doesn't matter if it's a small sin or a big sin. Sin separates us from God. And that's why Christ came to die, to take the penalty for sin, to die the death that every sinner deserved so that we could have life and forgiveness in Him. And so what we must do is look to Jesus who did not doubt who did not manipulate, who did not ignore, but was faithful to the very end. And we are called as God's people, as little Christs, as Christians, to fix our eyes upon Jesus and live as He did. May we pray together. Our Father, we thank You for Your marvelous Word today. Lord, it sometimes pricks us in places we didn't know we had. Father, I pray that you'll bring a sense of conviction upon our hearts where we are tempted towards these subtle sins of doubting you, of trying to manipulate you, and ignoring your perfect plan. Father, we confess those things to you, those motives, and oh God, we beg of your forgiveness. We pray that the stream of grace flowing from Calvary will cover us. And Father, May we not presume upon Your grace. May we be grateful for every ounce of it that comes our way. We recognize, Lord, You don't owe us anything. And yet You so graciously give to us. Find us as Your children, faithful and sensitive to these things, to honor You in the big things and in the small things, so that Christ can be exalted and seen in us 
And it's for His glory and for His honor. And in His name that we pray. Amen.